everybody. Good afternoon. If I could have your attention, we'll get this started because it's going to be worth your while. I'm Tony Morris. I'm chair of the board of the Chester County Community Foundation. We're 25 years old this year and uh, having a great year celebrating philanthropy uh, as we go through our 25th anniversary year. And this is part of it. Uh, we're really happy to be here in Phoenixville. What a, a vigorous town you have going here, a great borough, and uh, it's nice to be here. This is the third of our presentations of the way we think about charity is dead wrong. I've seen it three times before, and now this will be my fourth. I'm not the least bit worried about being bored. It's really worthwhile. And we're glad you're here, and the last thing you want to do is hear from me. Uh, I will turn it over very shortly to our CEO, Karen Simmons, and uh, she will moderate the panel afterwards. It's been fun to see how the two panels before today went in different directions, and we'll see what happens today. But without more ado, welcome and thanks very much for being here. And uh, come to all of our events as we uh, celebrate our 25th. We'll be doing another TED Talk in the fall in, I think, the three same locations. And uh, if you enjoy this, which I think you will, uh, come join us for that and our other celebrations. Thanks again for being here. We thought we'd do a, a little bit of a response panel to uh, I adore Dan Pallotta. Uh, uh, this is now a classic. He's done, uh, this is uh, uh, several years old now. He's on tour, he's got books, he's doing consulting. He is still trying to change the world. Um, so we're really lucky that uh, he did a TED Talk early on so we can capture it, uh, especially since he costs $25,000 an hour now. Isn't that a terrific thing? He, he walks his talk. So um, what we have in the, on your uh, chairs there were programs which lists our illustrious panel's background. But how about, could you introduce yourselves briefly by summarizing your roles? And I have no secrets, we're very transparent. All the questions are here, and we will only get through half of them. All right, <laughs> got it? Because uh, we will by 6.15 uh, be breaking, so we have 45 minutes to have some response panels. Could you introduce yourself by roles? Uh, sort of what you do in the nonprofit sector, staff, board, volunteer, donor, uh, the size organizations, nonprofit orgs you've been most affiliated with, uh, small, medium, large, extra large, extra small. Um, geography, local, regional, national, interstellar, that sort of thing. And your biggest passions, your fields of interest. Ladies first, Louise, would you go first? Surely. I'm Louise Smith. I am the president of Countryside Consulting, and that is a Oh, Louise, can you speak up? Because we're going to have Lou Baccaria and Bob Rigg tell us if you can't hear. Yeah, you'll all raise right? your and hand. I just saw the sign. Okay. Mm -hmm. Louise Shorn Smith. I'm the president of Countryside Consulting. We are a small accounting firm and we provide finance and accounting solutions to nonprofit organizations. We basically come in and work hand in hand with you as your outsourced accounting department. We work with small to medium-sized nonprofits, and primarily in the Philadelphia, met, I call it the metropolitan Philadelphia region, but a whole lot of clients here in Chester County because this is where we're located, um, and we live here, we work here, and uh, we just love working with the Chester County nonprofits. We work with all kinds of nonprofits, the arts, the environment, um, museums, education, social services, my personal passion for, goodness, 40 years has been agriculture, particularly organic agriculture and environmental uh, sorts of things, and that's where I have done a lot of volunteering uh, in the county. Very good, thank you. Richard. Okay, uh, my name's Dick Kunch. Uh, born here in Phoenixville, lived here in Phoenixville, I'm dying in Phoenixville. Uh, so, <laughs> not today. <laughs> uh, that's not, I used to have a high school teacher said, ah, Quincy, you're born here, live here, die here. What time? Well, you know, it turned out to be a pretty good, pretty good thing. Uh, I worked 60 years uh, for Phoenixville Federal Bank and Trust. I don't look that old, I know I started as a child. But, <laughs> but I, I retired about a year and a half ago, and I am uh, vice chairman of our board. During, uh, during my tenure uh, with Phoenixville Federal, we're a mutual institution, we're not stock. So as such, uh, you know, we were making money and one day I said to the board, you know, we're making a lot of money, 
and I think we should start to give some of this back. So we determined to tithe our income back to the community, and, and we've done that for any number of years. And I guess there's not too many nonprofits in town that we haven't benefited. <laughs> we seem to be the one that everybody targets for different things. And, and that's been a, a, a real gem. I, I have served uh, as on most boards in Phoenixville during my lifetime, uh, mostly as chairman. Uh, I guess one of the real uh, <clears throat> highlights has been really the Phoenixville Community Health Foundation, uh, which was an outgrowth of the sale of Phoenixville Hospital. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we were able to have about a $50 million uh, pot of money. And the first thing we did was hire Lou Bacaria back mm -hmm. there to uh, get us started off right, and uh, he's done a remarkable job. And the foundation has done a remarkable job in identifying the needs of people in our area and serving those needs. Lou, how much money have we given away over the past 20 years? 38 million. 38 million. $38 million. So it's been a real, uh, uh, it's been such an impetus here in Phoenixville. Uh, and again, uh, we took the former hospital uh, footprint and we limited our contributions in that area. Focus. Okay. That's, that's our focus area. And uh, well, one of, the, one of the latest things we've adopted is uh, low-income housing. That's going to be going forward one of our uh, real points of interest. So that, that, that's been a real godsend. And I was privileged enough to serve as chairman, that initial chairman, uh, for gosh, seven years before they kicked me off. So. But I'm still on there as an emeritus member. So yes. it's all been good. It, it's been a very rewarding uh, life experience. It really has been. Mutually beneficial. Very good. And uh, we also have the honor of having a, not a clone, but someone who's trying to fill some big footsteps. <laughs> Come on, Kirk. <laughs> Let's do a point counterpoint before we go on to Bob. <laughs> uh, so my name is Kurt Kunch, and I'm a, his son. And um, I'm also <laughs> born and raised here, brief stint in college and right back into town. Um, so I also work for Phoenixville Federal Bank and Trust in the wealth management area. And, um, you know, when I first got out of college, I, I grew up uh, seeing my dad doing all kinds of stuff all the time, um, volunteering on top of working, singing his way out the door every morning. And I knew that uh, as I got older, I wanted to do follow in his footsteps. And so when I got out of college, I was looking around and um, at different community organizations and seeing which one I would cut my teeth into. I got to uh, participate in the Leadership Academy. It was started by Lou at the Phoenix Hill Community Health Foundation. Met a lot of really great people there. Um, and I started out uh, with the Historical Society of the Phoenixville area as their treasurer. Um, and then there, I just couldn't say no. Um, for a while, and I think I was on like seven nonprofit boards, and so that was a lot. But I wasn't married, didn't have kids, so it was just lovely, right? <laughs> go to work and go to board meetings all night. Um, so, but I think one of the things that that taught me was, you know, you know what I saw in in with all of the organizations I've been on, things that are great about some of those organizations, and things that are are weaknesses within those organizations. Um, and then moving on, um, I chaired Petra Community Housing for eight years, so we're a 501c3 developer. Uh, the most recent project is Steeltown Village here in Phoenixville. Um, and then uh, currently I chair the Economic Development Corporation in Phoenixville um, as well. Had some great people that came before me. Um, this building here was one of the first projects that the Economic Development Corporation uh, had done. Um, it was going to be a drapery warehouse and um, our bank did a zero interest loan uh, <laughs> to uh, basically save the building. Um, until the Association of the Colonial Theater could be formed, <clears throat> and then we turned it over to them. And this is what you're sitting in now. Um, and then uh, we, through some grants, uh, we see here the Foundry Building. Um, we had uh, gotten grants for that and then sold that to the Hankin Group. Um, Bluebird Distillery, uh, we had bought that uh, building um, and then sold it back to uh, Bluebird a year and a half later. They were our tenant for about a year and a half. So most of the nonprofits that I'm involved with have been on a smaller scale, um, mostly Phoenixville based. Um, I think the ones that have given me uh, the most joy um, definitely in seeing things, you know, kind of um, to the point of 
you know, really, really nimble. Um, grew up really, really big was uh, my time at Petra. It was a really, really great, great thing that, um, you know, we hired a great executive director who's done a great job. Um, and I always try to, with every nonprofit, you know, I, I want to leave it better than I found it. And I want to learn things, you know, everything's baby steps. I'm always learning. I'm not the be all end all like all of us in here. You know, you learn from other organizations. And, you know, fortunately, I've had some great mentors um, in the community that have really, really helped and uh, will continue to help. So. Thank you. Mr. Stanek. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. My name is Bob Stanek. Um, I actually started uh, my career in healthcare, and I've always been in healthcare as a registered pharmacist. Um, I practiced through around 1982, and I'm the first one to tell you that if I start practicing again, I'd kill you, so don't get me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, always have stayed in not for profit, faith based healthcare. Had a number of opportunities in Norfolk, Virginia, Buffalo, New York, and eventually ended up back in uh, suburban uh, Philadelphia, uh, where I had the great privilege to be the CEO of a uh, very large uh, healthcare system. We have facilities as far north as Portland, Maine, as far south as Miami, Florida, some large, some small, some in between. Um, always had the career goal to retire when I was 55. I did not make it. I was 58. <laughs> so, you know, we were very, very blessed to have that opportunity. Evolved into uh, governance work on a national basis, uh, working with a lot of private equity firms, uh, publicly traded organizations, not-for-profit organizations, all on the governance level. Um, about two years ago, my wife and I finally decided to retire. So we moved to Florida. Uh, tried tennis, golf, everything you can think of lasted for four months and decided this is not for us. <laughs> so we've decided to come back to um, our home and our roots. And um, as I said, we really have been blessed. So we've started a, a small consulting firm that works uh, solely with not-for-profit organizations, uh, helping them, if you will, take the next step from a leadership perspective, a governance perspective, as well as a philanthropic perspective. It's good to be here. Great to have the four of you on this panel and all of you in this room. And thank you for making us have to go out and get more chairs. This is a good thing. Let me ask an overall question for everybody and then dive into some of these questions. And based on your answers, I'm going to change the order, just warning you. So the first question is, um, see these lovely little uh, candies you have? Yeah. I'm a stoplight uh, person. I love to know how people feel about things. You know. Uh, are you really strongly agreeing with something? Are you really disagreeing? You're sort of in the middle. So um, when you hear Dan Pallotta talk, if you haven't already started to uh, eat these things, uh, Dan said something like, Americans should stop fixating on overhead costs and salaries and instead focus on the nonprofit's ability to accomplish big mission-related goals. You agree? Do you disagree? Or are you sort of in the middle on that? Interesting. Oh, you don't have any. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Put them up nice and high. Let's see. All right. So we've got some in the middle. There's nobody who disagrees. Nobody? Okay. And so, okay. So um, for you who are on, in the boardroom for nonprofit organizations, think of the last decision you made. Did it support this premise? How many, I mean, think of the last complex decision you had to make about pay or about overhead or more marketing monies or trying to really secure some big finances. Did your decision as a board member, did your vote as a board member support that, not support it, or some come out in the middle? Yeah, it's a little more colorful for the folks who think about it. Interesting, yeah. So there is a difference between, yeah, sometimes between the desire and the action here, right? All right, now you can eat your suckers, but um, I, just, I just, yeah, like to know where we are in this one. As you talked about, about here, I mean, it sounds great that Dan Pilata says, you know, we should have all these things going on in nonprofits, and in some cases they're in the middle. And Bob, you were the uh, yellow, uh, you want to explain your stance sure. on this? You know, I, I clearly don't disagree with his premise, um, but at the same time, it's not an either or, it's a both and, right? Mm -hmm. and? And what I mean by that is, 
in order to get that uh, achievement of that very, very big goal, the infrastructure necessary, call it overhead, call it what you will, can't be forgotten. In fact, I would suggest it has to be enhanced, but not, an, not forgotten from a perspective that, oh, we're just going to focus on our goal. I'll tell you an interesting story. Um, I had the opportunity when I was doing some private equity work um, to actually, I was asked to go out and help run a new six-month-old startup company related in healthcare doing how do you improve quality in hospitals and health systems. This company started up in San Francisco. So went out and, you know, here you got the 60-something going out there working with these 20-somethings in San Francisco, San Francisco. Right? So we're going through the process and really focusing on the infrastructure, the overhead, the, getting this company started when it's only six months old. So here's the thing that was the epitome of what I'm trying to explain. You can't forget the concept of structure and overhead and, and, and the infrastructure because the vacation policy for this company was take as much time off as you need. That was it. There was nothing more to that. So the, the message there is, and they had a great, big, hairy, audacious goal, right? Mm -hmm. They had this yeah, wonderful had. goal to, to improve health care. So again, all I'm suggesting is it's really not at the expense of overhead, but rather strengthen that, be good at that, be excellent at that, so the outcomes that you're trying to achieve, those big goals, mm -hmm. can in fact be achieved. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anybody want to add to that? Your perspective? No, I agree. I agree with that. I mean, okay. you know, you don't want to limit. You don't just want to look at a at a, a nonprofit and say, well, how much of that goes to overhead? Oh, ten percent is too much. We don't like that. You have to keep everything in perspective, but you have to control the expenses to the great extent that you can. Mm -hmm. You really do. Mm -hmm. And one thing I, I like to do with my dollars that I give, I really like to give it locally because you can see results. Yeah. You can see results. You can really see what your dollars are doing mm -hmm. as opposed to giving to. Now, you know, all these national uh, nonprofits, you know, they all serve a purpose. But you don't know what the end result is. But when you give locally, you can see the results. And, uh, you know, sometimes that encourages you to do more mm -hmm. because you can see the good that your dollars are doing. Right. Hands on, invested. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Karen, I think that to add to what Bob was saying, to kind of put it into practice here, when I'm working with nonprofits, Louder. what I think should be done is that. Knowing what the large goal is, the mission and the goal and the growth that you're looking for, as you look at positions like the lead position, CEO, executive director, et cetera, or you're looking for your fund, key fundraising professional, don't start with what can we afford necessarily, but what do we need to achieve that goal? And then you'll determine based on that description, what does that position require financially, and then you'll have to figure out how do we afford it. I mean, it always comes back to money in the end, but look for what you need to be successful. Have any of you had experiences where you thought you were going for one thing and you ratcheted it up and how did that work out and how did you make it happen? Yeah, and I well, and just to kind of add to that, and then to go to that is yeah. that you know I think that some I think um, you know looking at you know sometimes it's really really uncomfortable, especially at the local nonprofit level, to take that hard look at the executive director that's been there for twenty years, to take a look at everyone that's been on, and they, they cycle on, they cycle off, and they just stay and stay and stay, and it's really uncomfortable, and. Um, you know, one of the early boards I was on, I came in and my first job was to fire our executive director. The board members that had been there for years said, we have to, we have to let this person go. Who's going to do it? Let's get the new guy, the Let's kid. Let's get the new guy. <laughs> and I was like, all right, well, I was a theater major in college. I can, I've seen that. Let's go. So I went into my office. I studied all, you know, how to do it and everything else. And that's, that's what I did. It was uncomfortable. It was very warranted. It was, um, but at the same time, that was the first thing. And I think that, um, you know, when you look at, you know, and I've, you know, become friends with many um, director of development and advancement. 
um, locally and, and also a little bit uh, reg more regionally. And I find that, you know, sometimes those individuals, when they fail, as he talked about, immediately, they didn't make a profit on that event, you're gone. <laughs> and that, that's just, it's just wrong. Um, you know, and I think, you know, one of the things when, with, with Petra, when we looked at, you know, Steeltown uh, Village and, and getting that grant, that was a huge grant. No one gave anyone a, ch anyone a chance. No way. Not going to happen. They're never going to get that grant. Never going to happen. Never, and you, you never get it the first year, never get it the first year. But we were confident in the team that we had um, and the capacity we had on the board to be able to take that and, and make that a reality. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that surprised a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, they were able to accomplish that. But, you know, the one thing that I'll say about, you know, to Dad's point about seeing things locally is that, you know, this town, I'm, I'm Phoenixville biased, um, and as our mayor will will say, Peter back there, you know, this there's so many awesome nonprofits in Phoenixville and so many people that care. And, you know, what you see downtown here is a result of that. And a lot of people in a lot of towns say, how can we be them? How can we be them? You have to care. And sometimes you get lucky, right? Like you get lucky. You're going to find a great executive director, a great uh, director of development that's just amazing. Sometimes you've got to pay up for them. But you've got to have, you know, impact, um, you know, the buzzword now is to have, you know, impact on, you know, not just your mission and your vision, but let's, what are the steps? How are we going to hold this person's feet to the fire to make sure that these goals, because then it's a lot easier to justify the larger expense. Say, look, this is what we've done. We accomplished this. We're on track. Um, and I think nationally, sites like Charity Navigator do a lot of charities a disservice by saying these are the top 10. Look where all their money's going. And some of them are very successful, but they really bad mouth some of those charities, and I think that's it's really unfortunate. Actually, the Guide Star folks, Dan Pilata had a lovely conversation with them after this happened to him, and uh, they about eight years ago amended. It wasn't just anymore what percentage of your money goes to program fundraising and administration. Guide Star then added all these other things for the nonprofits to start to fill in about who's on your board, what's your leadership like, what's your strategic plan. So because of what happened to Pallada and his issues overall, he went to battle internationally for nonprofits for things like Charity Navigator and GuideStar, which are really good websites, but people have to use them with understanding of the greater picture. It's just not a small percentage. There's much more to the picture. I wanted to ask you all something. Question seven on my list here. Um, there's something in the water in the air in Phoenixville, I think, as far as we've got a couple of bankers, we've got an accountant, we've got some in private equity stuff. Something's going on in Phoenixville that you're able to get some nonprofits with enough financial backing to take some bigger risks and to promote some bigger projects and bigger innovations that's not happening in other parts of Chester County. Um, how do you do it? I mean, it's more than luck, Kurt. I mean, once in a while. <coughs> once in a while, you get lucky. Yeah, you get lucky once in a while, but there's a lot of luck going on in Phoenixville. What do you, how do you? No, I don't, I don't think it's luck. I think I, it's the yeah. people that make up the borough of Phoenixville. Yeah. Bye. It's okay. <laughs> this is some kind of square. <laughs> you know, it, it's it's the people in Phoenixville that make a difference, and, and people make a difference no matter where you are. Right. It's the people that generally care about this town, uh, who have been here a long time. They've committed dollars to the town, not just to charities, but in in, in their homes, things like this. So it, it's near and dear to their heart. And so they're willing to go the extra mile to make sure our town succeeds. You know, I, as a young boy uh, in Phoenixville, it was booming because we had the steel company. We had everything going on then. And then and on a weekend, uh, the downtown would be filled with people just walking around. Because everybody walked in. You only had one car. You didn't have multiple cars. Uh, and then the demise of Phoenixville when the steel company closed, Goodrich closed, the West Company, the Army Hospital, everything closed. And everybody said, Psh, guess what? The Rising Phoenix is dead. Right. Well, enough people thought the Rising Phoenix is not dead. Right. Kurt alluded to this. What we and other people have said that we wish we'd have saved our theater. We saved this building. And the night I always said to Mary Foote, who was our executive director for a number of years, he said, Mary, the night we relit the neon sign out front, it was like a beacon. Come on downtown. 
and people came. Hmm. And they came to see shows and whatever. And then, it, then you needed restaurants to service those people. And just it just mushroomed. And then people began to invest big dollars in town that heretofore they would not do. So it's, it's the core population that we had and the influx of a lot of young people like our mayor. Peter, how old are you? 33? 35. 35, sorry. Oh, old guy. <laughs> but there, then, uh, there's... Uh, <laughs> now, th Peter's just done a great job. He's, you know, he's energetic. He's everywhere. Anything, sh Peter's there. And he's a spokesperson for our town. And, and they're the people that make Phoenixville what it is today and what will make Phoenixville what it's going to be in the future. So, Peter, thank you. So, but there's also something about hitting bottom and then having an incredible uh, desire to like work really hard to bounce back even farther, which may be a little different. Plus, there's a huge amount of diversity in Phoenixville, too. There's a so huge th amount of diversity. And, and it's know, a positive, we, not a negative. Oh, it's a positive thing. Yeah. It, it truly is a positive thing. Uh, it, it's funny. <clears throat> Uh, one thing we have in the fall is is the Phoenix Festival where we burn the bird in oh, Phoenixville. Yeah. God love the Phoenix. All it really is is a bonfire, you know? We used Big to have one. bonfires in high school, but didn't have But the first year we had the bird, and it was down the far end where the new Burrow Hall is. I was down there that night, and you saw these thousands of people just walking down the street. Unbelievable. Unbelievable to watch the bird burn. And that's that's just turned into something tremendous. Peter, last year, uh, we have a walking path that goes out to Phoenix Park because we had to move out there. There's no place in town to burn the bird. I mean, everything's built up. So Peter led a contingent of people out of downtown. They walked out there, and there were thousands of people there. I mean, it's just that mm -hmm. spirit of community that's here, that's, and that's what drives it. Uh -huh. You know, Karen, yes, I, I think what, what you hear when you really reflect on the, on the Phoenixville story is it's a combination of they've learned how to build on great relationships, right? Right. And when you can build on great relationships for your not-for-profit, you can really make a huge difference by having a relationship and being able to build that and tell that story. I think the other thing I heard when you were describing that, Dick, is the, is the concept of scale, right? Right. You know, you've been able to build on one thing to another to another, and you're building scale around that. Louder, Bob. And then the third piece, I'm sorry, the third piece that I heard was, Karen, you said diversity. And I will tell you there is such a richness if you can capitalize on your diversity, because that makes you stronger. The difference makes you a stronger community yeah. organization, call it what you will, because of that. Absolutely. So it seems like you've touched on those three concepts. And from an, from an analogy perspective, that seems like making Phoenix look very special. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And also, I would have to say, listening to Kirk, I heard him say, the, I heard him say the bank gave an interest-free loan, yeah. which is yeah. caring community caring. banks. Caring, caring community caring. banks who are in there. It didn't allow something to fail. It, it had a plan. I heard you talk about Petra Housing, which is a nonprofit with a very important mission. This building up sort of mission, uh, in you know alongside all the other great nonprofits in the town. And then I, you didn't speak a lot about the grant, but going for this particular grant that sounded like it was large and, and quite the stretch, getting that made a huge difference. And you have people who care enough to put their effort into doing these things. So that's where this financial backing comes in. There's a lot of convergences, most definitely. What about the whole um, question number five? When you start to do these larger projects, um, the financial backing, uh, the whole thing about executive pay. Uh, I might posit there's probably a couple nonprofit folks who think they're a bit underpaid in this room. Um, just thinking I, I about it. Probably guarantee that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and in the Dan Pilata world, where um, nonprofits uh, are doing amazing things. What you want to actually see is the nonprofit CEOs and executive directors who are compensated for their work, uh, who at more than fair wages, um, who, attract, who are attracted to the sector because of what can be done. Um, I think it actually, when that starts to happen in some towns and some nonprofits, it actually impacts the relationship between the CEO and the board. 
It impacts how one appraises that CEO. It impacts how other staff members are paid, hopefully better, um, and it changes the corporate culture. Have you seen that happen? And uh, what are the good, the bad, and the uglies that you've seen come along with it? You know, coming from a uh, not-for-profit world, uh, particularly in, in hospitals and, and other healthcare services, um, hospital CEOs um, and other administrative staff, if you look 30, 40, 50 years ago, probably suffered to a certain degree from that phenomenon. And over time, the, the healthcare industry has seen their key leadership salaries grow pretty dramatically. Um, a couple of learnings around that. Um, clearly, there's a need for both external competition and internal equity. Right. So that if, in fact, you're looking at an executive director, then the rest of the staff has to be paid equivalently, equitably, or else you're going to run into trouble. Mm -hmm. The second comment I would be made, particularly for those of you who are sitting on governing boards, if you go down that path, I can tell you um, for our CEOs, myself included, I was in the newspaper once, twice, five times every year complaining about these horrible salaries, and it occurred in every town where we had a hospital. So be prepared as governing board members to be able to objectively support that. Right. And we'd always have our governing boards understanding here is the value associated with it. The third comment I would make is um, in order to um, not only attract but to demonstrate the outcome associated with making that investment in salaries, performance indicators, well done, well documented, approved by the board, and then essentially compensation is based on outcome and performance. If you don't do that, you will be subject to a lot of criticism around that. I'm a, I'm a very big believer in, in literally finding individuals and compensating them fair, excuse me, fairly and equitably for the jobs they do, and in the not-for-profit world, it is, uh, it's a major issue. So how do you measure performance and outcomes in the nonprofit world? Oh, Bob, answer that question in 30 seconds. Sure, I'll try. <laughs> um, you know, it all starts with your mission and your strategic plan, right? And if you have a strategic plan that has clearly defined objectives, you can have key performance indicators or indicators that demonstrate whether you're successful or not. You essentially tie those key performance indicators to the compensation piece. I would also suggest, you know, I'm a big believer in core values. So you want to make sure that your compensation is also based upon a leader's ability to lead in a way consistent with the core values of the organization. I had a hospital CEO who was the best performing, quote unquote, hospital in our system, but he led at the right hand to Genghis Khan. We eventually let him go because he was doing things in a manner inconsistent. Sure, with the values. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about the whole thing about uh, ample marketing and advertising for nonprofits? I think it's interesting that Dan points out that, of course, people are attracted to the Coca-Colas and the Burger Kings or whatever because it's always there right in our face. If nonprofits had resources to do more marketing and advertising, would that help solve things? Would that, I mean, again, what are the good, the bad, and the ugly about that, getting the messages out? What does that do to the world? That might be a question to ask some of the nonprofit people. Yeah. In the room. Okay. <laughs> I can do that. <laughs> would it be helpful? Useful? Would it, would there, are there any downsides to it? Are there things to put in place to guard against anything that would uh, be unseemly because of it? I think, well, I think, and then I want to, oh, yeah. oh yes, Chris, there. go ahead. Chris. Right now there's a downside because of the way the culture is. If we spend money on advertising, or the PR that's necessary to do the work. There's so much of a pushback, and you hear about it. So that, that's the biggest thing, is first, which comes first, the chicken or the egg? Do you start doing it and change the culture, or do you change the culture to expect that kind of thing? You change the culture as you're doing it. Culture's not gonna change without people pushing the envelope. And you have to have enough, I think, yeah. Karen, what I've observed in the 20 years I've worked in this sector, is that people will always tell me, I, I never heard of that nonprofit. I didn't know they offered those services. And yet you're all here, and you've been here for an awfully long time. So marketing is very important. 
because you can't reach your target audiences without it. Every nonprofit I've ever done strategic planning with is the biggest kept secret. It always comes up on the SWOT analysis. Oh, we're the yeah. biggest kept secret. Nobody knows about us unless you're the YMCA or the Boy Scouts, okay? <laughs> Anything else, all the other 1.5 million minus two are, are the biggest kept secret. So part of it is how to get the word out. What else you got? Mm -hmm. Oh, you're the YMCA and the Boy Scouts, right? <laughs> so I just think a lot of nonprofits uh, neglect the power of social media. Yeah. Um, and look at everyone in the room. I mean, kids now, and I feel like I can say kids now, kids are uh, they're, they're very socially conscious. And every kid has a phone. So I think that a lot of nonprofits are missing the boat of being less strategic or should be more strategic regarding social media, which is virtually nothing in terms of organizing. Did you say virtually nothing is a pun? Because that was really good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. And we want to capture those kids because they want right. to change the world. Right. So, yeah. the and so it's both the print media and the social media, the electronic media. We have to do twice as much now, but it's crucial because there's people who just aren't paying attention to either side. And in order to really grow up with this generation, we have to do more. Yeah, what else, please? I think sometimes we see advertising it almost has a negative connotation. Sure. And I think if we focus on getting the message out, like you said, uh, you know, it's best kept secret, and I don't know, it's a lot of non-prosecutors. I was involved, we were involved in one, and they had a consultant who did that, and I was amazed at the results that people came back and said, oh, I didn't know that, or, oh, that's what you do. Right. And so I think that the key is getting the right message out, that it's not advertising, it's getting the message out to the people so they know what it is you're doing. And I think once you touch someone, we're talking about, you know, I think our as a nonprofit, we have to touch people so that people feel that they'll donate. <laughs> Just by advertising, I don't think that someone's going to open up their wallet and say, because I was advertised. No, it's got to be appropriate, but it's right. got to be better than the bake sale, in the sense. Right. Yeah. And he said something important. Uh, you said it got results, mm -hmm. and you want to report that. You want to be able to say whether it's to your board or to a funder, whomever it is you, ne you may need to talk about why you spend dollars on advertising or marketing. You got results and, and you know them. And so that's important to have you know, available for these discussions. You know, I think one of the best forms of quote unquote advertising and marketing, all of our not-for-profits have websites, right? Um, public publicizing your strategic plan and then publicizing the results you achieve after one year of that plan or whatever, it's a wonderful way to advertise the outcome of your organization. And frankly, it starts feeding into, you know, success breeds success, success breeds additional dollars. So um, I just think that's a great way to do it very inexpensively. Again, it, it, it's a free way. It's modifying the mindset so that it's okay to do this stuff. It's not, I mean, it is part of expanding the pie so that there's more visibility, awareness, visibility, and then more dollars should follow as well. And then there's bigger program because of it. Uh, somebody, yeah, please, Kelly. So, um, there's been a lot of pressure on nonprofits to minimize the amount of quote unquote overhead. So this happens all the time, and we're stretched so thin right. that to remove any dollars for advertising outside of yeah. kind of social media that we're all using and blog and whatever we can in terms of free media, it's near impossible for us to find any funding for overhead, uh, let alone advertising. And so to take any dollars away from direct programming that, that, that yeah. helps people we're serving, it's, it's almost impossible. So until we can figure out a way that that funders can see the importance of investing in advertising, marketing. Capacity building. It, it's just, there's very little dollars out there to do that. And so boards are very reluctant to say, sure, let, let's try this project on. And you can try it and say we get a billboard or say we take out advertising or we do recordings of some sort. You don't necessarily see a direct result of that. You, you can't necessarily correlate the we've had success because of this. Um, you can with online advertising, how many hits have you had, how many visitors have you had. Good. It's very difficult to do that with any other type of advertising. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, 
it's hard to find those dollars. Right. It was the social media part that is more virtually inexpensive. <laughs> Interesting. Still to pay staff. You do. It takes time. It takes an analytics. It takes thought and strategy. Yeah, but there's a payoff. Yeah. What else? What steps would you suggest that nonprofits start using to change the point of view of people who have been, if you want to call it, brainwashed all their lives to think that overhead is important at be low. Mm -hmm. I mean, all these years we felt like I want my dollars to be going to that thing. Mm -hmm. So what are the steps that we need to use in order to mm -hmm. change the thinking mm -hmm. to come around to what he is proposing? Mm -hmm. Because even though I agree with him, inside there's this voice saying, yeah, but. <laughs> And if we have to get rid of the butt, we have to change what the people that were trying to interest in giving, mm -hmm. how they think. Mm -hmm. uh, I never heard of him before. And you say mm -hmm. he's been around for years, but the nonprofits have heard of it. But the people who give to the nonprofits haven't heard of him. So, I'm wondering what steps you would propose. Maybe all the nonprofits have to get together and say, guess what? This is how everybody should start thinking. Well, yeah, there's actually a few things, and uh, dive in too. Um, in Milwaukee, they did a Everybody Profits from Nonprofits campaign. Beautiful. The nonprofits got together, and it was a public promotion advocacy campaign, campaign so people knew that everybody profits from mm -hmm. nonprofits, the value of nonprofits in the sector, to try to heighten people's awareness of the role nonprofits play. So that's actually been something that's grown over the years. But um, when they list the executive compensation and everything, it's from the, a negative point of view. This guy is running this nonprofit, and this is how much he's getting, and do you think he's getting too much? I mean... Well, there's always going to be that element, that sure. ...raised to think that yeah. they shouldn't be getting it, that they should be sort yeah. of like donating even if they can't live on what they're... Even if they have to get on welfare to go to work every day. Right. Yes. Yeah. So I how think do we change that? The other thing I would go back is to, to the diversification, to look at who's on the board and who's on committees. That, that's critical. You, got, you have to have a strong board. Are there business people on there who know the power of investing for the long run? Are there enough people who are younger who are coming up with this social ethic of we can do well and do good at the same time, and we don't have to be... Um, on slave wages if we're going to do good. Um, younger people actually want to have it all, and that's not so bad when it comes to nonprofits because they're going to be really strong advocates. No, the younger people have money too. <laughs> and it's bringing on enough people so you're not just bringing on tokens one or two at a time. It's bringing on enough en, en masse so that it's not a bunch of older people who have the money kind of disagreeing with that poor one person they sent in to fire that guy. I mean, so to bring on enough diversity of age and thought um, to, to really start to influence it. And you're just going to keep having a drain, I think, over time on quality. You're just not going to be able to keep up to scale. That would be my guess. Karen, I mean, you made a good point there. I, I think nonprofits have to look at their boards. Yeah. And you want to get some critical skills represented on your boards. Yeah. You really do. Marketing, I mean, an, an executive banking, for a nonprofit finance. can't do everything Ooh. him or herself. They right. just mm -hmm. can't be. You need a strong board to back you up. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where it really has to start to a great extent with your board and get the expertise on that board that you need. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people will not openly volunteer to serve on the board. Uh, no, <laughs> there's a reluctance. Then committees, but you have the to, report. Right? Well, yeah. and to that point, I think that was, um, you know, one of the things I, uh, early on, um, you know, the one thing that I think that everyone needs is you definitely have to circle the troops. You've got to have a strong board. Then you can... Uh, defend executive compensation because you're all you're a team, right? But the other thing too is that you know being on a nonprofit board is a privilege, and I think a lot of times, um, you know, there is uh, and, and we went so far uh, in the bylaws for one of the nonprofits to have a good board member behavior, bad board member behavior, where literally if you didn't do X, Y, and Z, so some profits have a give or get, give or get five thousand, right? Or you know you have to attend this, you have to do this. If they don't do it, you have to meet with the executive director, the chair, and you're off the board. Pretty easy. 
you have to get it done. I mean, you have to run the nonprofits like a business. Like a lot of times, I think it's a it's. I've seen a lot of like feel good stuff, right? It is great and it does feel good, but you have to run it like a business. And if people aren't performing, and if that's your executive director or that's your treasurer or that's you've gone to a committee structure, you've got to you you have to have everyone on board with that. That like, look, we're going to run this. It's going to be successful, but you have to just not bring on board members to bring on board members. I've seen so many boards that just bring on, oh, well, they're nice. They show up at all of our events. Let's invite them on the board. And then they just sit there, right? And they do nothing. They don't, there's no input. That When we go to a committee structure, they don't volunteer for anything. And they just sit there. And that's just, it's pointless. And it's, a, it's just a waste of everybody's time. You know, the, um, for those of you who work increasingly with foundations for dollars, as an example, you'll see them increasingly looking at the governing structure, who sits on it, competencies of those individuals, right. uh, diversity numbers, um, you know, that whole concept uh, of having a governing structure that is superb uh, does a couple of things, helps you attract um, good foundation numbers, helps you attract, frankly, good leadership, because a good leader will be attracted to a great board. Um, uh, and, and clearly having that board who can be your voice, your, your persona, if you will, in the community is essential for you to meet your mission, I think. I would posit that it's harder in a small place where everybody knows everybody to sort of ask people to sort of step aside, but it's a really, really important thing to do. And it's okay to celebrate the person's time on that board and say, and next, let somebody else in the door. And we've got to be better about finding ways to do that. And I think that if there's clarity to what those expectations are, if they're written, if they're explained in the the, the policy. Well, in the policies, but when someone is being invited uh. to consider being a nominee to the board, the discussions have to be frank, you know, that you have expectations. You have expectations of time and money and being committee members, et cetera. And, and the clarity needs to be there such that if they don't perform, you can talk to them and see if they'll turn around. But if they don't, then they should leave. Mm -hmm. Nice. Curious as to what your thoughts are with respect to um, giving a bonus to an executive director. Ooh. Okay. Nonprofit <laughs> bonuses. Um, <laughs> again, I'll give you history coming from the not for profit world. Um, it took us about five years to convince our board that it was something that they needed to consider, and it took them another couple of years to say, okay, we'll do it but it's how you do it is the real key. And that is, it has to be based on just the bonus for bonus sake. The term bonus is wrong. It really is, what I would suggest to you, is at risk compensation or variable compensation that's based upon a predetermined, agreed upon objective that's measurable, achievable, and documented. And at the end of the year, you get there. Again, I'll go back to this issue of core values. Some of those objectives have to be financial. Others have to be developed around a strategic plan. And third have to be, I think, developed around how you are as a leader. Now, that's hard to measure, but in fact, there's ways to measure that through employee opinion surveys, through how, how your board uh, views you. So, you know, I do think there's an opportunity for not-for-profits to move into that. <coughs> Similar to the channel, it's an uphill climb. Mm -hmm. We have just started this conversation, but I promised a 6.15 time, so guess what time? Um, we still have food outside, right? Okay, we have food and wine outside. If, if, before we take our, 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 our leave, if you are serving on a nonprofit board or you have a board of directors and you think it would be useful to get this discussion going in your boardroom, um, one of the things our community foundation would like to offer you is that um, we'll have some staff or consultants come to a board meeting and show the Dan Pilata video and then facilitate just a brief 15 or 20 minute conversation just to try to get things instigated a little bit. Okay? So I just want to put it out there. If you're at all interested, um, good old Stephanie way back there, um, just give her your card or just send it to info at chescocf.org. Um, and we'll come to a future board meeting, and if you don't know where you're meeting and you want to come to our place, you can have our place too. But I'm sure there's some place at the bank we might be able to find out as well. So yeah, thank you so much for coming. <laughs>